Hey, everybody. Okay, how was that for a smooth transition? I'm using the streaming software. Hope all's well. Let me know. I'm going to get turned on my chat over here. I know my voice can be a little out of sync, but that's just the way it goes with this software I'm using. Hope everybody's doing well. Thank you so much for uh, for being here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about with my good friend Keith Williams, who you guys all know, of course. Keith, we always have fun. So this morning, I was like, what do you want? What do I want to talk about? Let me get Keith online because we always have a good time. Um, you know, so uh, good time hanging out. And we talk all the time. He's one of my good friends. And we've actually never met in three dimensions, which is really funny. He doesn't live that far away, upstate New York, but we will at some point. We're, we're threatening because I've got family upstate. So um, we plan on meeting. So the first thing is I want to say thank you to BV uh, for doing the uh, moderating. As always, last minute, every morning, I'm like, hey, can you can you do today? <laughs> it's like, yes. So thank you, BV, as always. Um, I have a masterclass coming up this weekend called Unlocking the Pentatonic Scale. And it is 25% off. It's a live Zoom masterclass. And if you cannot make it live, you can catch it on the replay. And um, that is 25% off. Use that link. It's this Saturday at 1 p.m. And I talk about how you can use your pentatonic scale, uh, not just in a blues way, or how you can use your pentatonic scale to outline chord changes, or and or how you can use your pentatonic scale to get modal sounds. So uh, mixing it to get Mixolydian and Dorian sounds, but by still using the pentatonic scale. So you don't necessarily need to use your modes if you use your pentatonic scale, not thinking blue scales, you can get some really, really cool sounds from, you know, just classic rock stuff all the way through Miles Davis and John Coltrane. It's a really, really cool thing uh, that when I started realizing that the pentatonic scales function more than just playing an A minor pentatonic scale over an A minor chord, it was a real eye opener for me. And what makes it easy is that you already know the pentatonic scale. So you don't have to learn some new fingerings, but you get new sounds right away. So there you go. That's on Saturday at 1 p.m. And I also, just for today, I have my 50% off my Mastering Minor Triads. Um, the soloing was Minor Triads, excuse me. And uh, a lot of you guys have picked that up. I just wanted to, to extend that sale for today for those of you guys who have not picked it up. And for all the people over at Keith's. And if you want to sign up for YouTube freebies, go over it. Use the link there for jamguitarlessons.com. Okay. I'm going to bring my good friend Keith Williams on. And Boomski. Oh, here we go. Hey. Hey, how's it going, man? In the chat, everybody, they gave the answers already. I think we're done. I know. I think, well, right. And I just said we have to wait. And are the volumes okay? I can turn me down. I can turn Keith up a little bit. It's hard to tell. Over. You can do that? I can turn you up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So right. I all definitely, right. I know I'm loud. I'm like, I'm like short in the front. I got the big amps behind me. I'm almost loud. There you go. Um, well, I, I don't have those. So. Well, this is what today is kind of about. You know what I mean? Bigger, um, bigger not big. Right. Right. So we have some parameters that we want to, um, if you got, oh, by the way, if you guys see me looking over here, I've got my camera here, my main camera, and then Keith's over here on my, my display. So I'm going to try to not look like I'm, you know, looking, there we go. That's maybe a little better. I can't work this out because it's not interesting, but if not, I have my <laughs> camera above and then I'm looking up and it just looks really bizarre. So how can you yeah. say that? I'm sure they're riveted by the whole. I know this is really, <laughs> really exciting. How I, I mean, look. Uncle Left Eye is like, is Keith going to be wearing the uniform? They, they they don't even understand. Like, this is a shirt. It's the shirt. It's the luck. I'm not a lucky shirt, but it's the shirt. I have six of these, but there's <laughs> this one. And I right. only put this on, you know, like to film. I actually filmed earlier today and I didn't. He had no shirt on. I saw some. I, did, I didn't put this shirt on. And and it was a mess. So everybody, watch the new video. Yeah. <laughs> I as you see, I think I did maybe one video with that. Um, with my uh, what's he called? Upstate tuxedo. What's that called? What do you call it? Oh, a Canadian tuxedo. Somebody corrected me. They said that uh, that's really a denim jacket oh. and denim pants. But all right. Yeah. There you all go. right. We'll let it go. Okay. So um we're going to talk about the subject of best at home amps which is a really kind of funny thing because i don't really have any i talked to jason lachlan earlier he goes uh you realize you don't have any at home amps right and i'm like <laughs> i know every, everything i have is like big gigging amps but there's uh we'll talk about that in a minute well and my and my favorite thing on this subject and it's the reason i thought of it when jeff and i were talking about it was when everybody asks i always quote jeff and the, okay. and the quote and the quote goes Hey, um, I, I'm just a guy playing at home. What should I buy? You should buy a Princeton. Oh, you know, I have some money. I, 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 I could, you know, spend some money. Okay. Buy an old Princeton. Yeah. <laughs> That's yep. the punchline. Boom. That Jeff yeah. always says. Yeah. Well, so we've just given we'll away, you know, yeah. well, some more thing, but, um, so we're going to break it down into a few cattle categories. Uh, we're going to look at combos. 
we are not going to talk about digital monitor modeling. We'll talk about modeling amps because I think those are great, you know, but we're not going to talk about like my fractal because then you have to plug that in to studio monitors to, you know, that's a whole other stuff. I'm talking, we're talking about all inclusive units that can either have um, uh, multi effects in them or not, or just, you know, so the, for me, oh, size, weight, and are they giggable? And then we have digital and tube. So we're going to break it down into those categories. We're going to do, we're going to pick our favorites in these categories. And, right. And, and, say, and say why. Yeah. And also yeah. there's going to be plenty of amps that I don't own, that you don't own. So we can't talk about them or have heard them. So that's something to think about too. Like people are going to be like, what about this? It's like, I'm sure it's great. I haven't tried. That's what put the disclaimer. If you have an amp that we don't mention, you think it's good, then it's good. Yeah, you know, we're just going to talk about the stuff that we like, and while people continue to talk about denim, <laughs> I know I sent us in a completely. <laughs> these are pearl snaps. Yes. Uh, anyway, I own three like three different generations of this shirt. I could go an hour. I, I'm going to do a live stream, maybe April first. Is time. that a Levi uh, shirt? I, I, yeah, it is. It's, a, it's the yeah, Barstow. Yeah. I, I should have them as a link, an Amazon affiliate link. You should on my on my, <laughs> on my page. People like, are like, you need the logo. I'm like, it doesn't like need a logo. Know. I don't yeah. mine doesn't have a logo collecting income. <laughs> okay, so let's let's start let's start um All right, so let's talk about pick uh, a category. Yeah, let's go about, okay, let's talk about the digital ones. And this is going to fall into, you know, some of the volume we could talk a bit about that, like some of them you won't want to gig with, but sometimes you don't need the gigging app for the home app. So um portability, all those things, plenty of factors. So the first one I would go with cuz it actually had one um, and I, I did give it to my neighbor because she's starting out in guitar and she's doing okay. And I just wasn't using it and I had bought it for certain gigs, but was the boss Katana. Um, I think that that's a really good amp for the money. And especially when you, if you find one used, you know, I thought it was a pretty, pretty good sounding amp. So if we're talking like a lower budget, that's kind of down there. Um, you know, I think boss stuff always sounds good. Um, you know, the, the problem, the curse that I have is when you have really great amps, sometimes when you play a digital thing, there's there's always going to be something sort of lacking here and there. So I'm talking about an amp that I play and I'm like, yeah, I could totally, this is fun playing with this thing, you know? So the Boss Katana, and one little quick thing that I found helps, just a little aside, is if I have just even a light little boost pedal, like my um, uh, Vertex Boost if I even have it on just a little bit, a spark boost, you know, like the, uh, the, the, uh, whatever makes that company. You know. DC electronics. Thank you. Yeah. You're Anything welcome. like that. I found that that kind of livens it up a little bit. You don't have to put a lot of boost on just a little bit. I found across the board, even at a low volume house amp, if you put on a little bit of a, a boost, it sounds really nice just because it adds a little more dynamics to it. I think that that's, that's pretty cool. I, I've actually had long conversations with Brad Jetter, uh, Jetter pedals, Jetter gear, and sure. with um, David Barber, who was on my live stream last week. And mm -hmm. their theory about that is that um, by having a analog circuit up front, you're getting a feel. And the other theory is that, that it's an impedance thing that you're getting a, a good matching, like, especially like the, um, uh, yeah, the boost, the vertex boost mm -hmm. has a great buffer in it. So yeah. the buffer is taking everything to a level which is consistent. And then, but, but in front of that, you've got analog circuitry. And so you're, it's, it's doing what you're kind of missing in a model. You're getting some analog circuit between you and the model. And I, I personally have, I, I've actually been playing a lot with an HX stomp and without a pedal, but people have seen my little whiteboard here that's got two pedals one that's an eq that i can just reach down and, and move and knobs and then that's going into a stomp so but again we're not doing that i i totally agree i mean i typically when i have my catalyst setups um you're going to see probably a pedal in front of those and i i totally agree that that's a really good idea somebody put in the in the stream that it'd be good to try to do as we go along um do different money categories. And we're going to talk a little bit about yeah, that. Sure. We, we were talking earlier about things that are going to end up on the list. And Jeff, for example, started like browsing the prices of two rocks. And we were frankly laughing. Yes. I, at, I'm ashamed. At his, at his backdrop. I'm ashamed. Yes. I'm ashamed. <laughs> he's not, ashamed, he's not ashamed, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. That, that's the last thing he's, he's delighted. <laughs> well, as a uh, Basil Tiffany just said, uh, uh, let me show this one over here. This is totally true. Like, 
I played a show with Box Ten. It was fine. It sounded great. Would I choose it over Dumble? No, but it sounded great. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and actually, I I'm very um, inspired by like a pair of Cantana um, Catalyst sixties. Yeah. Uh, it's great. And and I mix and match amps, and it's like it's like having an amp collection right there. And these things are three hundred bucks a piece. They're the price of like you know a pair of Venuram pedals if you're right. lucky. You know. Yeah. Venuram pedals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More than right. that. So. Yeah, um, and then BB just put in the latest update for the Helix is very good. So yeah, a lot of these companies are getting better and better and better with this stuff. Like if, you know, Fractal ever put out a little amp, I know you can do the power. Like I, I'm very happy with this stuff, you know, especially at home because we're dealing with lots of volume issues. So the first thing I would say, if you get any of these modelers and even a regular amp, especially the modelers, I like the idea. I always thought it was an impedance thing, but I like the idea of the analog circuitry front end, maybe a little bit more. That makes yeah. a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Touch, touching a capacitor a, and a resistor. Yeah. If you have a small amp at home, whether it's you know, digital or not, and you're not 100%, I would just try even a really inexpensive, just a boost pedal and keep it on. I found that that made a really tangible difference, especially with the Katana when I was using that. And, um, I had like a, one of those weird a high paying cocktail gig where I was just in the corner playing guitar. I was background music. I could, I brought a looper and played, I could play nothing for three hours, just loop over pseudo jazz standards. But that was perfect because it was light. I could play music through it. And I just brought my Strat and I brought a buffer pedal and I was like, oh, this is, this feels, this feels pretty good. You know, like I'm, I'm totally fine with this, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, one of the p things that people are dropping things in here, like a vintage, five watt Gibson. One of the criteria that Jeff and I were talking about earlier was this is sort of, um, if, if it was going to be a standalone, you know, we're immediately talking about adding a pedal, a boost in front of it, but we were like, nah, it really should have reverb. Right. Which, which just to be clear, kind of speaking from the five watt world corner of the world kind of knocks out all the champs, except the new Fender Vibra champ reverb, which right. is a cool little amp. Um, but it's very small and it's, it's a tube amp. It's not very inexpensive. Um, so we're back to that of like sort of layers with well, um, a small reverb plate, obviously then. So yeah, it's not exactly. Gonna, yeah. yeah. Right. So if we're doing the catalyst ones, we got to talk tone master. Everybody okay. here probably remembers that I had a pair of deluxe tone masters and I flipped them and went to a Princeton tone master. And this is where it kind of becomes a category of weight and space. Uh, interestingly, for example, the Princeton Tone Master weighs about 20 pounds and a Deluxe Tone Master weighs about about 20 pounds. It's like 22 and a half, 23 pounds because it's got a Neo speaker in it. And especially if you have like the, the blonde one, which has the Neo cream back, which is my preferred speaker. Or, and then that that firmware in it. Those are sort of like, do you have enough room in the corner where you're going to put your amp? There's right. no contest for me that Princeton versus having the deluxe the deluxe is giving going to give you more flexibility when i owned those amps i ran them on half power most of the time so i was kind of you know in the model playing around the eight or nine watt kind of area which frankly is still pretty darn loud um you know in my living room yeah. um so it, when it comes to me i really like the tone master stuff um the main criticism most people throw at me is what's going to happen when it breaks i'm like it's a $750 amp. What's going to happen when your $750 worth of pedals break? Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's the exact same cabinet dimensions as a regular deluxe or a Princeton. So you could just mm -hmm. swap it out for whatever the current thing is that fits into the Princeton or deluxe cab, or you could go ahead and put a, you know, boutique tube amp in that cab and you'd be right there. Cause they're both beautiful hardwood cabs. So I, I, I don't really, I don't really get too worried about, you know, the total lifespan of an amp that takes no maintenance now because it mm -hmm. doesn't have tubes versus a tube amp, which we know will have maintenance while we drag it around the city. Right. Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. So there's um with the tube amp or okay, with like the, the size of the amp, that's also really important. I mean, depending how you live and where you want to live and how big yeah. the amp is and, you know, um, for instance, we'll get to it. Like my favorite, small amp that I've had here was my brother's 64, uh, Princeton reverb, uh, just a beautiful amp. And, uh, it's sitting in his apartment he's not at that apartment for months now. I'm like, dude, come on. Yeah. We should just go over there. I'm just going to go over there and get it. I already have his, uh, <laughs> I have a 64 strat. So, you know, um, Oh, you have that there. I have both of them here. I got, I've got well, mine and his. Yeah. Yeah. So and I'll remind everybody that if you want to hear that, Go look, go watch the video that Jeff and I made together called Beano on a Budget, where Jeff is running. We, you were playing your your super lead, 
and a 20 watt Marshall. And then you plugged the Barber direct drive into the front of that 64 Princeton. And we were like, that's one of the <laughs> best Marshall sounds we yeah, have on the video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That, so, so if you want to hear that amp and that combination, go over there and watch that video again. Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll get back to that one. So I, I have played the Tone Masters and I think they're really good. Now, someone was just saying um, in the chat, which is just an interesting point here. So let's talk about that for a second. That uh, Smell of Glove says Tone Masters aren't all much, that much cheaper than tubes. It's a no brainer just to get the tube amp. Now, if you want to get a deluxe reverb, it's a lot more expensive than a tone master, right? A tube deluxe reverb, and, I believe. And, is more and, expensive. and actually I would argue that they're probably uh, fully 50% more for the tube amp. Yeah. They're, they're, they're more expensive and, and they're going to be, and they're going to be 50% heavier. So you, those are both categories where the tone master, you know, is kind of, you can't beat it. Um, I've heard some people say, I had somebody write to me recently on Instagram, DM me and say, and ask me if the breakup, from the Princeton um, Tone Master was a little fizzy. Mm -hmm. I don't use it that way. I try to treat it like a clean platform and I'm gonna get it from a pedal. And you, I know you're the same way with an amp yeah. like that, Jeff. Yeah. Um, okay, so the Tone Masters I think are great. They have them at a club here in New York called Skinny Dennis. I've heard, I've not played through it. No, I have, and I thought it was fine. But a lot of times, um, like Jason Lachlan, who's uh, on the channel here sometimes, maybe here today, go follow Jason Lachlan's YouTube channel. A great guitar player. And he's like, yeah, sometimes I just use those because, you know, when you're over 30, um, you know, I just don't want to carry heavy stuff anymore. And you're thinking like, oh, you know, um, I'm going to, I can play through that. It's, okay. Here's my thing. This is all these kind of little tangents we get on at times. If really? it's my gig and it's a guitar centric gig, like when I played with, when I played with Robin Ford the other night, um, <laughs> I'm using the two rock. That was, so that was smoothly done. Thank you. you. There's a little bit of Ed Grimley in there. You wove that in there. A little bit of Ed Grimley in there. Yeah, little bit of Ed Grimley in there. Um, <laughs> I must say. So um, I'm going to use the two rock. Um, he ended up using the hot rod DeVille that was there, which is interesting because Oz noise 412 TS1 two rock, which is way too much. But if I'm going to sit in with somebody else and I'm just the guitar player, I'm happy to use the house amp because I've got my pedal board dialed in for hot rods or deluxes, and I know what I'm going to get, and usually good, so I can just dial that in. But when I find um, uh, that uh, I can, if I know what the amp is, I'm kind of good. But heavy, you know, great tune should be heavy and hard to carry. That's Tracy Farmer. Yes, well. There you go, Tracy. <laughs> he's yeah. the only well, we man. We don't have cartage, you know. I know two guys who own Dumbles, and he is one of them. So there you go. Um, well, and you know, probably the reason that Robin played through the DeVille is that also is what he's got his pedal board dial for. Mm -hmm. He's totally ready to go. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the heavy amps are great. Yeah. I mean, they, they sound great. There's nothing like this stuff, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about playing at home. We'll come okay, back to so, that. We're going to come back to that as big amps with attenuator near the yeah. end. Yeah. So the one thing I've had some experience with, I've had a few students who've had it and they brought it over is the spark. Oh, okay. I think that's really great. I saw some people talking about that. And what I also really like about the Spark and the Katana, especially the Katana Air, that's that little like radio thing. And you got the, you've got a, 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 a wireless unit that charges up instantly. You just plug it into your guitar. So that's really cool. I, I don't have one. I want to get one for like, if I go away, that's perfect. Yeah. Like if I go John, upstate. John, John Cordy, some folks know here, has been raving about the, uh, the Katana headphones. Which are really cool. I just keep playing with headphones. Yeah, well, he, you know, he's got a new little baby, so this is perfect. These, that's not what these are, but right. um, that's perfect for him right now. So that's another version. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, BB saying that. Uh, yeah, John Bollinger uses. Uh, yeah, I've talked to method. John about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, for the same reason, like, okay, you're playing those Nashville gigs. Some of the ones that he's played, those those kind of gigs can be pretty rough and tumble. So you you know, you just want a, an amp that if somebody spills a beer on it. You don't really care. It's going to, there's no tubes to fail. So I understand amps like that. And so it's funny though. I, the, my neighbor's daughter has the amp who we're good friends with. It's kind of on a like, yeah, but if I need, I'll just give you a call and I'll just grab it and give it back to you, you know? Right. And so for a gig like that, yeah, absolutely. I'm playing at the Jersey shore when I was younger, where people are like, you know, beers flowing everywhere. My friend who plays at Jersey shore wraps his pedal board in, in cellophane. Like in Saran wrap, he bought the packing kind, you know, so he just uh -huh. puts it, wraps it up because people are always going to spill stuff on it. You know what I mean? So, wow. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. Anyway. Um, so the, 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 the spark is really great, really inexpensive. And one thing I really like about the spark, that's a ton of fun as it's the Katana air 
is that you can run it off of your phone. You, you can change all your parameters on your phone. And also, uh, you can play your iTunes through the unit, and it sounds good because it's a flat response speaker, so you can jam, play along with jam tracks. Mm -hmm. So it's all really once, um, all, it's all together in one thing. You can play your music, you can jam with it stuff off of YouTube or whatever, and you've got, you don't need any cables because you've got the, the wireless. So I highly yeah. recommend that. Uh, my brother got one for his, his apartment, and he's like, this is great because it's got, you know, every effect that you would want and you can just adjust it from your phone you know now the right. problem with the boss presets is we've all talked about the same thing with the line six presets sometimes you turn on it's like it shows you everything it can do you're like do i need delay flange chorus reverb delay whatever you know why right. auto filter on this all at once so no you might have to dial back a bit but uh, I think that the Katana Air and the Sparks are both really, really cool units. Well, and then since you mentioned the Sparks, I I, I have a uh, Yamaha THX30 that mm -hmm. I took when I went to Nashville and then uh, down went and made videos with Zach last year and then went down to Atlanta and made videos with Rhett and Rick. And um, I mean, like I was one trip into my hotel room. This, yeah. This tiny little amp. And, and I'll be honest, there's not, there weren't, for the kind of music I was playing in my room, there weren't a ton of different settings that I really loved, but then there was this one setting that was just so full and it's like, it's coming out of this little tiny box. I, yeah. and it's, you know, it's stereo to boot. So, I mean, something like that too, again, if, if the situation is at home, no space, uh, college dorm room, everything you just mentioned, dorm would be great. Um, yep. and a little Katana 60, I mean, uh, catalyst 60 would be great in a dorm room. Same thing. That's what I tell people. If, yeah. if that and money are the things that are on the table, uh, weight, mm -hmm and size and money. That's, those are the ones to go with. Yeah. Um, right. so one thing that, you know, just put it right here. Hey, Mino, what's up, man? Um, mini spark battery powered and guitar strap strap around, walk around playing on the farm, playing guitar, like a God, pretty funny. Um, you know, and there are certain things that I've discovered too. Um, ooh, that's not the wrong one. All right. Uh, all right, there we go. I got, I need somebody to handle this for me. Um, you do, you need a producer I need a but producer. you can't afford that. Yeah. Sometimes, like the really, really small speaker ones, there's just you can't get past physics. No, right. You know, right. so the really, really small ones can be cool. Like you can bring it home. Like a, I think Spark just released one of all these ads. Like this is the most amazing thing. It's like, yeah, physics. Just it's the speaker is like a three inch speaker. It's gonna sound good for a three inch speaker. Yeah, I'm not, I just got a new Mac laptop because of because. video editing. And the new speakers and the new Macs are in, in, unbelievable. Like it's just yeah. like, oh my gosh, like you've stereo surround. So they can do it really great, but it, it, the larger the speaker to a certain extent, certainly the better it's going to sound. And that Yamaha you're talking about, those are really cool too. I found uh, there was like one or two sounds that I kind of liked in it, but that's what that's, I was like. Right. Yeah. That's fine for me. Yeah. Great clean sound, you know, that and a yeah. Strandberg in my room and what was easier than that? Nothing. So yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so what's the next category? The next category would be, uh, so size and weight, which is all kind of the same, and gigable. Okay, let's talk about, well, let's go to the tube amps first, and we can go back to the gigables. Okay. Okay. So you want to do, do size and weight of yeah, tube let's amps? Yeah, let's do the, the size and weight. So all the ones that we've discussed so far are non-tube amps, so they're all going to be much lighter than, right. than, yeah. than any kind of tube amp you're going to get. Right. Um, the size thing would be, like the Katana comes in a 50 and a 20, so like, they can get a little, they start to get a little big because you have a 12 inch speaker and Catalyst, same thing. Yep. So if you're looking at like the, the tone masters that you discussed, like, um, the Princeton has a 10 inch in that one, right? It, it does. I recabbed mine with a 12, but yeah, it has a 10. Yep. Okay. And, and the 10 inch is a non Neo 10. Okay. I oh, they right. supposedly couldn't come up with a Neo that, well, and it just didn't in a 10 inch, it didn't weigh that much less. Right. Um, okay. so yeah, I recabbed it in a solid pine Mojo tone cab and put a Neo Jensen in it. And it's the same weight it was when it had a 10 inch speaker. Right. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm into it for more money on the project, but yeah. Yeah. But you knew it was going to upgrade. You're always going to, you know, yeah. a speaker can be that's well, first of all, and a side thing before you get rid of your amp, try a different speaker. That's a right. huge yeah. thing. Yeah. David Barber on the, on the live last week said it about three times. It's the only thing in your rig that makes noise. I love that. I was like, what? what? I love that. You got the only good. thing in your rig that makes noise. I was like, it was a fun interview. Who, who is this guy? You know, exactly. Right. Yeah. That's David's pretty amazing. funny. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so if I'm looking for a home amp, I'm kind of looking for something kind of small too. So I can bring it to a different room. Um, I've got my, 
guitar room here or whatever. And you know, my wife doesn't allow it anywhere else in the house, which I totally understand. Like, why is that amp here? I've seen pictures of your workspace. I understand. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> I say with, with love, you know, it's shame, shame, <laughs> shame, shame. I'm not going to, I'm not going to organization shame you in front of all these people. Oh man. It's terrible. You're a good it's friend. Terrible. Good, I know. Good friend. Anyway. Um, I accept this about myself. There you go. Wabi sabi. There you yeah. Go. Um, there so the Princeton for me, like if you're, I, I like the size of that. If you want a good, and when this brings us to the next little thing right here is the gigable thing. Right. So you can't gig with the small spark. I wouldn't get, it's not a real, it's not a real amp. Do you know what I mean? Those to me are at home amps and it sounds really snooty. If you put a mic in front of it, but if you're talking about like a 20 watt spark, the great sounding, but sometimes on a gig, with the drummer, you're going to be like, where did everything go? You know? Yeah. So out of the amps that we discussed, um, it, it has to be like a Katana 50 or 20, like, you know, yeah. and um, the Tone Masters, those are great because those are those are those little power knobs, switches on the back, and then you can gig yeah. with those because they're full volume amps. When, and again, I would say that when you're coming down to like having a deluxe, which I think a lot of people that think of as sort of the minimum gigable, mm -hmm. um, depending on the drummer, um, the tone master you can turn it down to 12 and a half or 10 or 5 or 0.5 right. i think whereas a deluxe reverb there's no master volume on that yeah so in the tube amp category like this one of my favorites um is a vox ac10 which again has a 10 inch speaker but mm -hmm. as i said to jeff earlier today it's not really vo you know very voxy voiced it lives someplace between vox and it's an el84 amp but it lives someplace between there and fender sounds which in the end just means it takes pedals better has a yeah. great 10 inch speaker in it. Um, and, and that's a great, I, that's a, a, and they're not expensive. They're like 400, 500 bucks. Yeah. So compared to like a tube Princeton, um, which is going to be like 12 or 13. Yeah. So, At least yeah, when somebody yeah. just posted, it said 1699 for a, a deluxe reverb now for, well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. For, for the reissue 65. And then, you know, if you go all the way to, you know, go back to our joke about an old Princeton, um, you know, if you go all the way and get the 64 custom, uh, deluxe I had at one time. It's a twenty four hundred dollar amp. Yeah, yeah. It's not a great, but yep. and again, if you if you're not going to move it, if it's going to go live in a corner of your music bedroom studio, um, mm -hmm. I always smirk a little bit when I describe this room as a studio at nine feet by twelve feet. But if you're gonna if you're gonna just park it, then it doesn't really matter. And we'll come back to that with that wall of goodness behind you. Yeah. You know. Th then then yeah, tubes all day. But again, no master volume on that yeah. amp. So right. yeah, we're going to come back to attenuators. So, um, what Beaver is saying right here, and I totally agree. One of my, oh, that's not the, I keep on hiccup because it moved, it moved on me. It's like a moving target sometimes over here. And here we go. <laughs> I'm sure what Edward said was good too. I'll, I'll get back to Princeton reverb with a 12 inch Alessandro is a great small. Amp. Yeah. I yeah. mean, uh, for right. me, the and ultimate say like New York, this is a good one again, New York city, um, amp. Yeah. Optimal is a Princeton with, with a 12 inch speaker. Like yeah, that. Jim Campolongo did it with his 10 for years and years. Still does, I guess. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, my, a lot of my friends just put a 12 inch speaker in a Princeton, usually an old one, you know, and you can get like a, a, a silver face with reverb and have it black faced or whatever you want to do. Yeah. It doesn't take much. Yeah. And, and then, and the reality is that, um, well, and Zach Childs just did a video about using, he got a headstrong, which is a Princeton with a 12 inch. And I can't remember the speaker. It's a pretty heavy 12 inch speaker, but for him, He's driving to gigs in a van with a whole bunch of guys um, going from the Nashville area over to gig with friends in Tulsa. And he's like, yeah, the difference between like even tucking my deluxe tone master in among the gear mm -hmm. versus a Princeton size thing with a 12 inch speaker has made a huge difference. So, sure. Yeah. Right. Right. And, um, but then I would go for a 12 inch Neo speaker, but I'm going for weight. Now my, when, when we're jumping ahead and as I jumping around a little bit, my, Two rock, you see that there's a head there right now, but it's a combo I, I can have as a combo my studio signature. I put in, I love the sound of EVs with a, a Dumble style lamp, a two rock, mm -hmm. but they're oh, insanely heavy. Yeah, they're just yep. too heavy. So that in there is an eminence uh, neodymium EV speaker. EV and style. That, yeah, okay. yeah, and that knocks off a lot, you know, of the oh. weight, especially in a combo. Yeah. I need one of those. You do. They sound <laughs> great. I mean, they're not inexpensive, but it's. It's not inexpensive. Well, you need the amp too, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let's move on to, um, tube amps. 
Yeah, we're we're, we're bridging into that category of yeah. tubes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you want to do you want to do some bigger wattages and talk about attenuation and master volume pros sure. and cons of that stuff. Yeah, that's that's the, something where you have more way more experience than me, but. All right. The first thing I would say initially, of course, once again, is a Princeton reverb. I just love those amps, 10, 12, 20, 10 inch speaker, 12 inch speaker. But at home, I don't think the 12 inch speaker necessarily makes a huge difference because you're not moving that much air. And people are like, you know, somebody asked me like, is, you know, 10, is 15 watt amp enough? I'm like, dude, 15 watts is freaking loud. Like DG actually watt? anybody who's had a five water isn't, that's enough at home. Yeah. You know? and, and you're talking about what wattage really comes down to is, is headroom before the amp distorts. If we're talking like tube amps, you know, it's, it's, it's just headroom. So what's the difference between a hundred watt Marshall and a 50 watt Marshall? I think it's like three dB if I'm not mistaken. I think you're right. Yeah. But right. it's uh three dB is a lot, you know, in one, you know, cause it, it expands ex exponentially. I can't remember how, but it's the headroom. You, it, it stays cleaner longer. That's mm -hmm. really what it comes down to. So, yeah. um, all right, so for me, the Princeton reverb, because I just love the way they sound. They they has it's got a nice reverb, it's got tremolo, takes yep. pedals really well. I'm just happy playing that amp by itself with no pedals. Right. It's just it's an enjoyable thing to just do. Al Edelson wants to throw in Blues Jr. It's on and, my list. Um, he's he's right in that in that category. I, I actually have always found Blues Juniors they're in that smaller, slightly smaller box. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is about that that amp design. I find them to be much boxier sounding than a Princeton, an open back Princeton. And, I, I do as yeah. well. And I think they, they do benefit from a better speaker. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and my buddy, Dan Lurie, the, the amp guru up there in Burlington would say, and if you change out the output transformer, but now you're doing some major surgery right. in the amp, but and then they do amp. get way yeah. better. And, and I, I, lots of places that are kind of fighting the volume wars will even have a blues junior on stage for like a blues jam. Right. Yeah, that's sure. a pretty clear message. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you're up now. What's next? What's the the the, the home amp? Oh, so what what do I like for a tube amp home? I gotta go AC10, um, and that would be my my price point. Uh, man, you know a um, a deluxe reverb style amp with a reverb. Uh, I mean, with a master of some kind. I really like, and actually, they're going to do a live stream on it tonight. Um, I really like the Rev D20 amps for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which is they're switchable. And actually I was saying to Jeff earlier today, Victory lunchbox head size amps, mm -hmm. um, many of which are have totally gigable max volume, have a switch where they're switchable down into like seven or 11 watts. And mm -hmm. then you basically got two amps in one with a switch. And I, I, I like that whole kind of trend in an at-home rig. Um, I've got a Victory V35 that's downstairs. It's sort of like um, me sitting practicing guitar right now, but it's been in the living room for a year or two. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like those a lot. Um, I think, and I think price-wise, you're running a pretty wide gambit right there too. Yeah. Um, and, and really good stuff. I, I've never been a big Blues Junior fan. I really like the sound of an AC-10 and like kind of what you said about the Princeton, perfectly yep. happy running a pedal board into the front of that with the master volume turned up about halfway. So you're basically, you know, taking the, Oh, they, you know, they, they call that a, a 10 watt amp, but even back in the day, that was a, that was a whole thing where they were throttling the EL84s down. It's a pair of EL84s, real tubes. So, you know, it's at least an 18 watt amp. Yeah. So you've got a lot of headroom. And I said to Jeff, I've actually read of a number of people that go ahead like a Princeton around New York and, and gig an AC 10. Yeah. Yeah. And the speaker that comes in, it is really good. So yeah, those are my favorites in that sort of size and category. Um, and like I said, you could go all the way up to, I was just naming things like, um, I know the guys at Rev like are launching this D 35 combo that they did. And, uh, one of the guys there actually told me straight out that the, they started thinking about that combo two and a half years ago when I made the video with the little tiny lightweight, 17 pound mojo tone, mm -hmm. you know, solid pine cabinet and yeah. the thing. And I was like, this is a rig that's 20 Watts and way more flexible uh, than a deluxe reverb with master volume and a low volume switch. So like I said, I, I really like those. And, and frankly, I like to support companies that I like the people and those guys are great. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They seem like really good guys. I don't know them. Really good guys. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Um, so, uh, the ones that I I've tried and somebody pointed up is the uh, car, you know, the C A R mm. makes, um, I know it's the mercury and then there's the something else, the B there's something other ones. I think, um, there's a yeah, rock. Mentioned it early. Yeah. Yep. Uh, those are great. 
and so that works on a situation of a, it has a built-in attenuator. So that's going to yeah. bring me to attenuators in a minute. Um, well, and so, Guitar Grandpa is is mentioning the Tongue King Imperial, mm -hmm. which got as a built-in Iron Man attenuator, and people rave about that attenuator. So yeah. I think that makes a big difference to have a good one on board. All right. Uh, one we didn't think about, which is really totally true, is I got to say absolutely that the yeah. quilter stuff, thanks for bringing that up. Quilter is, is great. Every quilter situation I've been in, I was like, you know, wow, that's just great. A, a good friend of mine gigs regularly with a quilter power block into a speaker. Yeah. Because he plays a lot of like, you know, club dates and he, it, where, you know, it doesn't, I'm not saying you don't sound good, but it doesn't need to be, you know, your best tube amp kind of gigs. It's just so, and I think it's got a direct out. So that really works well, you know. Um, I've well, tried you to see, you see like bl touring blues guys like Eric Gales has a signature. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Adam Mark, Mark, amps? Mark, yeah. Deep Mark, deep, yeah. DB Mark, right. Deep and he has yeah. a signature one. And so, it, I mean, it's like the same thing. It's class D amp, you know, with a, with, I tried some of those amps and I didn't really dig them for guitar. Oh, the DB Marks. Yeah. Okay. Um, BB mentions a uh, Benson amps. Those are great too. You know, like there's, I don't, these are ones that, these are the ones that I have experience with. There's so many, I'm not sure. I know some of the Bensons I've looked at didn't have reverb. So for me, it's got to have reverb, especially yep. at home. And uh, I just, baby, yeah, baby just put lazy J and they actually have a, like, you can buy a tweed from them that they've got then a reverb, little reverb circuit that they tuck in there. It's like, mm -hmm. man, great. We're, we're definitely in that fun yep. boutique category now. Yep. So, um, since we enter that, I'm going to talk about, uh, attenuators. So, I mean, you know, but my favorite at home amp is my, two rock bloomfield drive which is just ridiculously hysterical to call it a at home amp but it's my favorite amp um and i love the studio signature as well it's a that's the 20 watt 40 watt it is loud you know that's a loud amp loud 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 what is it <laughs> yeah it's loud and then like the, the studio signature i was talking to matt schofield i need the horn right and matt was talking about the new two rock which is the um, <clears throat> vintage deluxe or something whatever yeah. i forget what they yeah. call it and I played it <clears throat> at Nam, and you know Eli's a great friend of mine, and he's you know he's like, oh, we gotta you gotta check it out. I'm like, yeah, sure, okay, I'll check it. And what Matt was saying, it's the first two rock that you can get it to sound the way you want it, to, like to get juicy, to use Matt's terms, at um, a lower volume. Hmm. So the um, whereas two rocks, you know, they like the 35. People are like, oh, that little studio signature is tiny and small. It's 35 watts. It that loud, that amp is crazy loud. 35 watts and i use it as a um a uh clean pedal platform <clears throat> <I'll try, clears throat> excuse me i'll try to get any gain out of that because i used to really really push it super hard but as a clean pedal platform anyway so at home uh i have my two rocks and i think they sound great even at a low volume they just are really they have an excellent master volume so i'm very happy with that i have an ox which of course you can use to run straight in and a lot of people are asking uh, how i feel about attenuators and I, I hate them below <laughs> a certain degree. Okay. So if I'm going to take a hundred watt, my super lead, put it on an attenuator to bedroom level, it sounds like a swarm of bees because you're talking about physics. Like you're just pushing all this energy into this thing. And then you're pushing all the sound through your speakers and the speakers aren't doing anything. So there are components to this, that moving your speaker is an important thing, you know, like that's. So the best situation I found for that, if we're talking like no kind of money, is what just BB just posted. Of course, um, let's say the Fryat uh, power station. So this, the way this thing works, is it's like it. You put your big amp into it, it reduces the sound, uh, and then it has a power amp, and then you reamp it basically. Ah, and okay. so you can run into a speaker cabinet. So you can run your hundred watt Marshall, and you could put it at two watts. You know, and so you're getting the sound of the Marshall doing its thing. So it's attenuating, but it's also reamping and they work really, really well. They also have, mm. um, it's also a load box so you could run IRs through it. And it's also brilliant because there's an effects loop. So you can use your hundred watt Marshall with no effects loop, put effects in the loop of this power station and then re and then put it into a speaker cabinet and then adjust the whole volume. So conversely, also you could use a five watt champ, put it through <laughs> there and crack it up to 60 Watts. So right. it's you cool. But then you're, so you've got a hundred pounds worth of gear to emulate your 20 pounds worth of gear. That yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I like so that. I like that in, in the sense of like, that is a great solution, but it falls out of the, our, our parameters of which we've kind of set up. So yeah. for me at a low volume, 
playing through one of these really kind of great apps that I'm fortunate enough to own, I'm always using the pedal board. You know, if I want overdrive, the two rock has got an amazing overdrive, but it, you know, it, at a TV bedroom volume, it does, it doesn't, it's not what it's designed for. But if you turn it up just enough where your neighbors will freaking hate you or my ears will start to be like, I can't do this all day. Um, it sounds great. You know, it's cause it's not designed. It's not, it's not a bedroom amp. So for me, when I'm, if we want to talk about overdrive, uh, of a tube amp, unless it's like a, you know, master volume, pre preamp gain amp, I find pedals are the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think your point about attenuators is something you always say to me about master volumes of any design, you know, even the post phase inverter master volume where you're still getting your foot into the phase yep. inverter, which is a lot of part of the breakup and all this kind of stuff. Even if you throttle the circuit there below a certain amount, really, I, I kind of think of it as being below, um, two thirds down mm -hmm. anything, anything. If you try to, you know, crank it down past three on a scale of one to 10, you're just, you're just making the whole thing sound like a mosquito. You are. I agree with you on that. And that's, and I, we well, I'm, that, I'm that's what, kind of quoting you. Yeah. Well, that's why it's such a, why I agree with it. <laughs> that's why I'm making so much sense. That's right why now. it's a brilliant comment. Dude, that was an amazing <laughs> comment. Man. I think so you quote the right people, Keith. Yeah. So insightful. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Pretty funny. Um, so what, are we, what else are we going to talk about? Well, um, so I think, but I think your point about your two rocks is a great one. Now you're, you're back into that category of absolutely gigable, even on a straight up guitar gig, you know, 60, 64 strat over your shoulder in a gig bag and your 35 watt a studio head that you run into the speaker input on a DeVille that's at the gig. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. And, then, and, it, and actually with an ox box, but now we're since you're just throwing money at the problem an exactly. ox box at home, yeah. you're now you got it all covered and you're ready to launch your guitar YouTube channel to boot. Yeah, exactly. Or somebody had mentioned a little bit earlier with the Keeley pet on the Keeley, you said Keeley, like Kingsley pedals. Um, mm. but then you're, then you're getting into, which I absolutely love is stuff. I use them on the road and, uh, that's a whole other price point that we're starting to jump into where you're using a preamp pedal into a power section into a cabinet and that falls out of the parameters of which that we set up, you know? So, yeah. but I agree with you that somebody earlier was talking about the Kingsley stuff. I mean, my favorite one, you know, that I think, you know, I know that Mick from that pedal show is using, you know, is the, uh, the, the juggler, which is just basically the front end of a dumbbell, uh, on the floor and it's spectacular. You know, it's great. Um, you know, I have the minstrel and I have the harlot. So I, I'm a big fan of Simon's stuff. Um, yeah. But uh, I have the maiden. Well, I actually made in D, but Matt Schofield's got it in, in Europe. He's got, he well, borrowed it. Yeah. Um, that you had to send it back to me because you I had did. it. And then you sent yeah. it to Matt, it actually. To Matt. Yeah, you I sent did. it directly to Matt. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. Um, That's what you need, people. You need friends with nice gear to borrow. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that is the that is the economic move. You know, it's like, you like to sail? You yeah. a friend with a sailboat. Yeah. Exactly right. What about uh, okay? A few good questions here. Okay, um, I'm gonna probably click on the wrong thing. All right, where we go? Ba, 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 ba. You know, uh, I've heard really good things about the Thomas Blue Gaps. Uh, once again, you need a speaker cabinet, so it, it falls out of our combo thing. That yeah, I mean, that starts to fall into the line six fractal. You know what I mean? Like separate yeah. amp, separate pre something that amplifies your sound along with the, another thing. So. I know it has amplification in it. You would just need a separate speaker cabinet. I've heard really good things about them. I've actually never tried one. I, I haven't either. Uh, and they, they did one on the pedal show and they loved it. I mean, yeah. as much as they kind of disdain modeling stuff, they, they had the guy on, I think, and, and they liked it. So, yeah, one of my friends has one and uh, actually he ended up two of my friends have one. The only complaint that they've had was not sonically. It was more uh, volume. Like it, they, it, they felt like it, it should have been louder. Huh. That was my two friends complaint playing rock gigs with it. Hmm. Almost loud enough. So I, maybe that's just what I remember hearing. Well, and everybody would probably generally tell you that you want to have at least double the yeah. class D volume that you, you know, watt, wattage rating that you mm -hmm. would have from a tube amp. Right. It's just, again, we're back to physics. I so. agree. Um, what about room size and headroom? We kind of talked I, about... Yeah. Love this question. Yeah. 
You want you want to hit it first? Go ahead. No, go ahead. You were, you started. Um, it depends. If I'm if I'm at home, I don't care about room size or headroom because we're really talking just such low volumes. We I've done my videos and my tinnitus or tinnitus. You know, it's just it's just I I can't and I don't care to. It's a funny one. Um, when Robin Ford was at my house a few weeks ago trying out my guitars, <laughs> um, playing all my guitars, playing all my guitars, and he was um, he How was you go like, English <laughs> suddenly. <laughs> Um, I must say. So he was, uh, he's like, oh yeah, let's check him out. And we're hanging out and suddenly he's like, yeah, just turn it up. And he's playing. I'm like, you know, like in my house and thinking like, oh, curse me. I'm like, you know, it's just, so he's, but he's right. I mean, that's the way the thing's got a sound. He's like, oh, you got an overdrive. So I have my, my, you know, Zen drive thing, whatever the warm drive. And he's like, oh, let's put it on. And he's just playing. I'm like, that's really loud for home for me. I could never play well, that loud at home. And you you've know. said it before too, that you've had days where you're so completely uh, uninspired by everything. Mm -hmm. And then like the next morning you turn everything on and you just like, you just turn it up one notch more Ugh. and you're like, Oh, that's what these things do. Yeah. That's, that's why it sounds like that yesterday. It sounded like a mosquito cause I had it on the mosquito settings and now okay. it sounds like a completely other thing. And this is what it was built to do. I, I want to talk about that for a second. So you know, I'm a I thought freaking, you might. I'm a lunatic, you know, like all of us are. So I've got my, um, yeah, it's, you know, my my pedal board here, which is of course changed a little bit since the gig, you know. Um, so it's time for a new video. Yeah, this is a new video because I changed one thing, one little thing. <laughs> I'm dying to see where you fit this in because last time I talked to you, okay, you were in what a paroxysm. <laughs> okay, I had to lose something. So, okay, th this is this. Okay, the point is when I'm trying to get this to sound good at night, it like tiny volumes, everything sounds like crap. Do, yeah, right. yeah, no matter what, because even though these are great pedals, and then when you know the next day, you're like, oh man, everything sounds like crap. Then you're like, you buy another overdrive, you're pulling out thousands. Of, I have a lot of overdrive pedals, I admit. I need a, I need a 12 step program. Hi, my so, name's Jeff. Hi, exactly. <laughs> so, um, hi. I apologize for doing bad uh, English accents. I do. I can't do accents. Uh, I've got my brother in here. Does a pretty good Scottish accent because my whole family has the accent. I would so. think you should be able to do a good, a good Scottish accent. I just have accent no. There. I have no ear. You, for su like, you summered there. I, I did summer there. Yes, I, but I have no ear. I can't do it. So this is my. This is my budget board. You should see the expensive. Board. <laughs> now you really um, are in the confessional. Yeah. Board. Right. Um, what did you pick it up for? What were you going to show us? Uh, we were just, okay. So what I was just <laughs> joking around about, um, you know, this is amazing, but at a, at a low volume, it just sounds, it doesn't sound that great. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, oh, I'm just un un unhappy with, um, you know, with everything, the way everything sounds. And the next day, just like when it's daytime, I turn it up a little bit. I'm like, oh, there you go. Sounds great. Or I go in a gig. I'm like, what am I talking about? This sounds freaking amazing. You know, like, or just the amp by itself just sounds freaking amazing because you turn to the point where it's actually supposed to be going. So the whole pedal business is, is basically based upon people <laughs> playing at low volumes, trying to find the thing that makes them feel good. Yeah. So, okay. The thing I changed and actually, here, so, so maybe the, the head, the room size is back to how much volume can you get away with in a room that size? And yeah. then you're back to how many walls do you share with your neighbors? where you live. I don't, I don't have that here. I could turn up pretty loud in my living room yeah. and I'm going to be fine. So I share with neighbors, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, before, before we forget, cause we're, it's getting, we, we've been having fun already for 50 minutes. Somebody wanted to know what I mean when I say boxy and, yeah. um, and I can illustrate this better than I can tell you in frequency range. So I'm talking to you now through my mic, through my microphone. If I go like this, mm -hmm. that's boxy. That's it. And you're basically cutting um, the deep, the deeper frequencies, because I'm, I'm keeping those longer waveforms from yep. coming out into the room where they belong and getting to the microphone. So that's, yeah, it. I'm going to do the rest of the show in a Newark accent. That was terrible. I, I can't do one either. <laughs> like, like maybe a little bit like that. <laughs> I can't, I, I, I'd end There's up sounding Brooklyn like I'm on the I've Sopranos heard. and upsetting people. I don't want to upset. I can do Jersey. some of that. I could do yeah. that. All right. Anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, we can talk about what I changed in my pedal board later. Actually, I should have a little game course. What a little game. What did Jeff change? Cause you know, it changed. Um, uh, anyway. I, yeah. What's so the last the, category? The last category. Um, I think we're, I think we're categoried out, man. No reverb, size, weight, 
gigable. Um, we went through all the tube amps that we have familiarity with. Okay, this we want to touch on one thing is um, Marshalls. You know, a lot of people are like, what about little Marshalls? Uh, I don't, I love Marshalls, but I don't love um, what is the most commonly popular Marshalls. Hmm. I like JTM 45s, I like Plexis. So when you get a combo, something like the DSLs, you can get a pretty good kind of clean sound or edge of breakup. I think, um, you know, I think some of that you can get out of those, but it's never as cool as yeah. that, that. It's never crazy. But then if you get like an 800 combo, that can be pretty nice or a JMP combo, which weigh a bajillion pounds and they're really light. But right. you can um, go into the low input and then turn up the clean channel and it just gets this really great. I use that as a clean platform as well. And yeah, I am wicked smart. I am. I, I did go to school in Boston, so Be I can beautiful yeah, clean. And and people don't talk about Marshalls as a clean platform, and they should because they're just incredible clean. Right. Um, I built my the first amp I ever built was a JCM eight hundred, but I built it as a point to point. Mm -hmm. oh. Crazy, Ooh. ridiculous, loud. I used Mercury transformers. It was just insane, and yeah. and sold it to a guy from Miami to. To, to my knowledge, he's, get, he's making people deaf in Miami to this day with it. Right. But yeah. But the point was what you just said. The clean was the closest clean I've ever had to like early Pat Metheny. I just mm -hmm. was like, wait, this is a Marshall. Like, why? Why am I hearing? Yeah, you know, it's through a, it's, a it's, vertical it's, it's, two twelve. You know, with a slant top, it's incredible to sit there and play. It was just yeah. Some, I mean, a really great plexi or my probably my favorite amp of all time. And I can say this because the owner of Two Rock like, is a good friend of mine. His favorite amp of all time is my favorite amp of all time. It's a JTM 45 Blues Breaker combo. And he owns one that used to be Rich Robinson's. So, because, um, wow. you know, and then uh, I've played one <laughs> of the original ones and been like, yeah, but no reverb. So, I mean, if we're talking right. about that, but um, all right. So I'm, I've just got, I'm, I've got lost again. I'm just on these tangents. Uh <laughs> My point, is, what we're putting is sometimes well, you, you start. Somebody said it, somebody said it earlier. And I, I think that I touched on it when I said, if you're not going to move the thing, yes. you know, have, have whatever you want in the corner. That's great. Um, well, hey, David, thanks so much. Good point. I had an origin 20. I did end up selling it because it, it, you know, I got, I got more expensive amps, but yes, I really like the origins and they're really inexpensive. And I was reading up about people doing these simple mods on them to make it a really much better pedal where they kind of cut the corners or something like that. So thanks, David. Yeah, I, I've heard about that as well. Yeah, when, when David David got his Origin 20 when we were doing that project together and he, he immediately was like, yeah, you know, if you just change these couple capacitors, it becomes this other JTM 45-ish. He kept getting it closer after the video was over. Uh, you know, how do you love not love this about your friends who just get closer and closer and closer? They, they get pulled into these things and they can't stop. I, I, yeah. These are the kind of people I want to hang out with, you know? Here's our friend RJ online. There he is. Speaking up, of people man? with a few amplifiers behind, in the background. You got one or two. One or two. Everybody knows RJ. If you're not, uh, that's RJ. There you go. Great. Thanks, and man. Kreenar Kilku is dropping in, saying hi to people. Kreenar from, uh, from Croatia there. So, so I, you know, I, I'm excited, uh, and I, I don't want to overplug it because I, I was like a little bit involved in the beginning. I'm interest, very interested to see how much the new Rev D25 combo weighs. Um, I'm very curious. Sean Tubbs, you know, friend of everybody here, um, uh, was was very instrumental in designing that. And he and I had mm -hmm. a couple of conversations about the speakers they were going to end up using. I was plugging for the Neo Creamback. Come to find out the Neo Creamback is nowhere near as efficient. It's much, much more inefficient um, than like a regular uh, Creamback even. I think they ended up going with a V30. Okay. Um, so even more wide ranging and sort of more modern-ish, you know, sounding, I think. They're like RJ, yep, I use a small quilter combo for my living room noodling. Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks. We were talking about because I forgot about them. I played them. I don't have one, but I know they're great. Everyone well, and RJ them. did tremendous demos of those, as as usual. When they exactly, yeah, <laughs> we don't we don't want to. It's like uh, I always say, you know, when I had my own band, I you 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 choose the solo order. Mm -hmm. You never solo after the best guy. Nope. You, you hey, make oh, that guy go. That's my course. Yeah, buy that course. Get that course. Right, hold on. <laughs> See, what happens when I click on it, then it, it, the next thing comes up and it moves and I click on the one that was above. All yeah. Right. Um, At Creenar says it's the Lux Reverb Tone Master. There you yeah, go. Those are great. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, okay. Oh, okay. This is on the side. Yes. Hoping Jeff's next triad course is combining major and minor triads or diminishing. Yes, yes, and yes. 
Yeah, you only just have to wait. Just take a breath and he'll get it for you. Yeah. Do that triad yeah. course. Take a small break away from the triad courses because I don't want everything to be like, oh my God, another triad course, you know? So we're going to do some uh, some some soloing courses, a little more blues stuff back again, and then, you know, a few other things and, um, yeah. you know, how to wear a hat, you know, things like that. Richard Ansara says he gets Corey Congilio and RJ Ronquillo confused. Well, you know, RJ has that <laughs> set Sanskrit on his forearm, which is a dead yeah. giveaway. You know? And Corey's got the big mustache. Well, and the little tiny. And that, the, he's got the D'Artagnan big... going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> Corey's one of my very good friends. I know. I, that's why I'm laughing so hard. Uh, Corey, yeah, you should be logging on. You should be feeling that somewhere. Right he, now. he might be lurking. I feel yeah. Corey's a that, lurker. Is that like Corey? Is it, yeah, is he, it like Corey to lurk? I think he could lurk. <laughs> he's like sitting at home. He's like, what's that sound? I'm like, yeah. Um. All right. People are talking about. You know, it was funny. I was at a I was at a music store and it was Paul Riario. You know that guy from Guitar World did those videos. I, I he's like, know. hey, you're Corey Congelia, right? And I'm like, no. There you go. And he's like, oh, you oh, and I'm like, uh, no, but you know, no, but I could see how you could get us mixed up. Anyway, there we go. But that was pretty funny. Corey got a kick out of that too. So, so we're going back to buy a Princeton maybe a 12 inch speaker. If you have a lot of money, buy an old Princeton. And if you have a lot, a lot of money, buy that stack of stuff just over Jeff's right shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to put up affiliate links right yeah. in the description. We're, we're going to monetize this last well, three minutes like, of the show. This is like RJ on here too. Like you're like, Oh, look at all those apps. You're like, yeah, hey, I got to divide yeah. 13. Yeah. Too. How's that? So that should be fun. Um, <laughs> And then oh, there's this ridiculous thing, like the the Japanese dumble pedal. You know what I mean? Which is, oh, you got a dumbloid. I got a dumbloid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Checking I like it, it that that's this crazy expensive pedal, and they have like impact label maker. Oh, I know. It's funny on it. It's yeah, it's just like a, yeah, yeah. It's just they're just stuck on. I could peel them off. Are and, they really stuck on, or is it? Yeah, no, no. They, it's literally the impact. No kidding. Thing. They're yeah. not silk screened on there to look like an impact. Thing. No, no. It's it, they're literally. You can oh, see man. if you can. Isn't this fun? So yeah, but these actually sound pretty cool. Like the problem I have with some dumble pedals, and this one might be in that category, is um, they really cover the like the the lead tone really really well. But when they yeah. cleaning up, sometimes they're not. You know, yeah. as Robin said, I was showing to me. He's like, <laughs> yeah, he's like a pedal cannot sound <laughs> what, like an amp. I'm like, I know, but just you know. Mino Palouse makes an excellent point. He says uh, we've been talking about playing quiet through quiet amps, but what about playing quietly? through an amp turned up way loud, which is something that people talk there about all the time. You know, yes. like a lot of famous players, Landau probably being, you know, one of them, um, Roy Buchanan, you know, it's like turn the amp all the way up and then just crack the guitar barely on, you know? Yeah, well, this is, um, we've talked about this on some of the, like if how loud is too loud with me, with uh, Matt Schofield and David Grissom. You and, did, um, name drop away. Yeah, that's right. And Get your horn, yeah. This is something I totally do. And Matt and I have discussed this a lot. Like um, he plays loud. He plays very loud. Um, but, and I've had this situation with friends who sit in on my rig that um, if they don't play the rig the way I do, my amp setup can be really, really loud huh. because I kind of like the amp having a little more headroom available and then I can use my volume knob or the volume pedal to kind of set the thing a la Mike Landau. So I know I'm never going to run out of that headroom and then I can play really softly and dynamically and have that headroom. So that's a great point. You know, um, you know, also Pat Matheny talks about it on, with that interview you did with Rick Beato, um, where Matheny said, right, my dogs. There you go. All right. Yeah. That's a New York accent. Yeah. My, the dog, the dog, fuck, or me going dog. Daffordshire Terrier. That's definitely yeah. a New York accent. Yeah. There's yeah. two of them. You hear them both. Yeah. There's two, of them. <laughs> two pitfalls, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the sweetest dogs in the world. Um, they are. So uh, he was saying, which is true, the guitar, the dynamics of a guitar in its own is like that, really. And if you hear a horn player, like a ice tour with a trumpet player, and he'd be in the backstage warm, we would clear out because it was like a freaking fog horn. Yeah. So they can go really, really light to insanely loud, where you got to cover your ears if you're really, really hitting it that hard. Um, so with an amp, and a lot of people like Matheny was talking about, he'll have the amp pretty loud, but he'll turn the guitar volume down. So you get that, the headroom of the amp, the amp is doing what it's supposed to do. And then you get a much more dy broad dynamic range. So if we're talking about um, 
uh, if we're talking about headroom, we, we mentioned that a little earlier. It, for me, the headroom is just so I don't get distorted. My amp doesn't distort. Uh, because if it's a low wattage amp at a loud volume, you're going to run out of headroom. Everything distorts to distort. It doesn't get any louder. But yes, so at home, I will have the amp at a certain volume and just roll the guitar volume back because I think the amp just sounds better at that. And I roll back my guitar volume. So that's an excellent point. So we should have brought that up. Keith, I'm really disappointed you didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, Sean McCartney jumps in here to say that having the amp way up and the um, and the guitar turned down is uh, just an accident waiting to happen. And uh, for a ham-fisted right-hander like me, mm -hmm. that's really true. I actually sure. had one of my amp, one of my guitars in to have some work done on it. And they were like, yeah, you know, I, I changed out your volume pot. I'm like, yeah, yeah. this moved way too easily. I'm going to have to swap this back out to the one that was in there that I had chosen because it was plenty stiff, you know? So yeah, that's right. Dog. Yeah. There may be a hundred waters. Hear them still? Can you? <laughs> It's a Marshall major of dogs. The Marshall that. major of dogs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also like I've heard, you know, Daniel, Daniel and Juan talk about that. Like with this, when he records bass, he has a bass amp completely cranked and then has the guy play super soft. Cause it gives uh -huh. that that's, there's a particular sonic quality to those sort of things that happens. And as, as B was saying, yep. Yep. Yeah. Right there. So this is uh, where we're getting at. Turn up the you know, pick dynamics and guitar volume. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure we, if we, if we, brought in David Barber, he could kill it and shoot an hour explaining to us the harmonic stuff that's changing when the power tubes are working like that too. Well, the next way we could probably do a three-way conversation. We should do that. That's three of us. That would be scary. That would be scary. We'd all be walking on each other. Oh, absolutely. But um, <laughs> the funny thing is uh, it, with, with that is uh, it, it's totally the right, in my way of playing is that's my favorite thing of really having that headroom because the pick dynamics, like you're saying, those things really start to work. So this is where people talk about attenuators. A lot of times it takes that stuff away. So when I play clean at home, when I play at home and I want an amp that will kind of give me that sound and as low a volume as I can. So I'll turn the two rock up louder than I would and I'll just turn the guitar volume back down and it, it really creates, it's a whole other thing than having guitar volume full up. And then there's sonic stuff. If your volume pot's way open, you know, you got to get a little more high end. And if it's a little right. back off, you might roll back some of the highs. If you don't have any treble bleeds, blah, 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 blah. blah. So I think when, when folks see you play here, you're almost always using the aux. When you're just plugged in by yourself and we get on the phone or something, I'm not hearing the aux being used. No. I'm, hearing, I'm hearing you just play through your amp in the room with the volume on the guitar turned down. There's two things. I, mean, I do practice a lot with the, with the, uh, the fractal. I think I am as we did, you know, stump the David Barber. And um, when we talked about, remember that back and forth, you, people didn't know which one was the fractal, which one was the ox. Right. And I found the latest generation of the fractal stuff. It's really, really dynamic. I'm really, it's pretty shockingly good. And other companies too, not just fractal. I've gotten to the point where you're like, well, I mean, if, as I've said before, if someone's on stage and I'm, and they're using a real amp, I'm not using a modeler. If there's no other guitar player on stage, and depending on what the situation is, I'm let I would not be totally opposed to using a modeler depending on the gig. But if the other musicians on the on the stage have real amps, I'm never using a modeler. There's no way. You know? But you but you've flirted with the idea of just taking like an FM9 to Europe for a tour. And the reason for that is um, is uh, expenses. <laughs> I was going to say it's economics. It's the same reason that yeah. you'd have like plenty on stage touring the world with a cord, quad cortex and that's it. Yeah. Yep. And, um, it's, uh, it, the, the thing is, okay. In that situation with a particular band that I went to the Czech Republic with, you guys can check out some of the videos of that. Um, the, the other guys are more jazzers, you know, they're not real rockers, right. you know? And so the keyboard player is going direct, the bass player largely can go direct and he's got his own little in-ear monitor mix that he's created. And I'm like, what is wrong with you guys? You know? <laughs> um, and then, <laughs> Honestly, at certain gigs, it was just, it became problematic. And I don't want to play really loud because of my ears, you know? Right. And I just want it to be correct. It's got to compete with the drums. I want the music to be dynamic and compelling. It's rock and roll, so it's got to be at a certain volume. But there were a few rooms that we played that just, like some of these rooms were like a bit, you know, really acoustically not designed for a rock band. You know, you play like one chord, you're like, holy crap, that's loud. You know, and you're not even that loud. It was just the kind of the room. So I feel like you know, the keyboard player is like, can we try that? First of all, it saves money. And then we can control the, the whole thing. So um, there's all sorts of ways to go about that. We can talk about other things. It's all about the EQ. It's all about EQing it.
properly for the PA and for the house and all that. So there's a lot of work going on there, you know, and I think lots of people have touched, um, touched on it, you know, um, but that's a whole other thing. I've never really gigged with the fractal stuff, so I can't say, but plenty of bands do lots and lots of bands just, Oh, even on like the fractal page or was it G something 66, like the European fractal page that, uh, Justin Derrico, his whole new pink rig is the FM nine. And they spent time dialing it in because, you know, after a while, they, they, you know, the, the production company is going, well, we're going to Europe. Do we need all these amps? And no, it's gotten to the point where no. And if you're talking about, we've discussed this before, an interactive music, I find that I, it's much easier for an amp. I don't have a sound guy. So I, I said I would give it a shot and we'll see what happens. I, I might be miserable, but there are certain nights that it was the volume was an issue and I wasn't even that loud. It was just the room. I'm turning the amp around and putting like a, I'm putting a cymbal case in front of the speaker, like all this stuff. I'm like, you know, it might just sound better using like a UA dream or a fractal, yeah. fractal, a fractal. It just might sound better. So I'm worth giving it a, sh I'm, I'm happy playing with this thing at home. So if I could get the same thing to translate on the stage, why not give it a shot? Well, and you, and you just skipped right through again, the EQ question. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're all talking about sitting with just us with an amplifier. It's kind of yeah. bringing us all the way back to the beginning. I find the deluxe just to feel a little bigger in the room, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a band context where the volume is not going to be louder than a Princeton needs to be. A 10 inch speaker would be fine because nobody wants the extra bass, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The fact is it's a completely different thing. Absolutely. You're, you're going to completely change what's happening at the amp. You're going to be dialing it very, very differently. So the whole conversation about home amps is most of the time, how does it sound just you yeah. at home? You're just practicing what's inspiring, what's fun uh, for you. And then that's a whole other thing. What you do with that, even that same exact amp, if you have the bass player and a drummer over to run some blues changes, that's yeah. a whole other bag. So, yeah. And, you know, and most people say when they're, I think Mick and Dan were talking about this because I was, I watched them while I'm eating my lunch in between, you know, filming videos and all that and love watching them. Um, and somebody was chiming in. I think it was some of the uh, BB would probably remember. There was somebody in the feed who was saying, as a sound guy, and I agree from all my friends who use fractals on tours, it's always the high end and low end that need to be. Because at home, you're like, oh, I'm full response speaker. And then you get on a big PA speaker and you're you're in everybody else's area because the, the fractals got all everything, everything, every, every frequency you want. So a lot of times people say they have to really narrow it down. Or the house guy, the front of house guy is like, I usually have to cut the highs and the lows. And that makes perfect sense because, you know, yeah, you, it's, it's filling the part, uh, the part of a guitar amp. Absolutely. So, uh, like I said, I might, I might be miserable, but, you know, I, I got to play the game. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, we want to, I say the game, but, you know, I, I, one comment we got, which I thought was really cool, uh, was at one of the gigs, the sound guy came over to me and he said, you know, when you came in and you guys were, had your amps, I was getting a little worried because it was, it was a really nice room. With, it was a beautiful, great room, and we sold it out. And he's like, I was a little worried because we've had like bluesy rock bands and it's just too loud. And he goes, you guys started playing. I didn't even touch the board. Wow. And he's like, I just want to say, when I saw you put stuff in front of your amp, I was like, oh, things are going to be kind of really cool. And so my, my point is, is that like you, you, you're a performer. You don't want to torture your audience. I nothing worse than going to a gig that's blisteringly loud and you're sitting in front of it and you're like, God, why does it have to be this loud? Conversely, there's nothing worse than going to a gig and people are playing like with no commitment and no energy. So you want to find that middle ground. And if I can find that with some modeling stuff, I'd be very happy to try it as long as you can get through that. You know, yeah. Bill Shokita says he loves the Sir Badger 18. Yeah, the Badger is great. It runs out of headroom fast. I did some gigs with that amp. I love the sound of it, depending on the gig. If you're mic'd or not, the other guy had a hot rod to build. You couldn't hear me at all. Just disappeared. Yeah, you said you basically, by the time you get your foot into getting the tone you want, you're out of headroom and dynamics. It's done. And it's just all, it's all distorted. So a great amp, Mike Lando uses it on the road with um a lot with say like uh one of the amps that he does use on the road with, with James Tyler, James Taylor, excuse me, is uh, the Badger, but James Taylor's stage volume is incredibly low, I've heard. So yeah, yes, that's a on. great low volume option. And he might just use that for overdrive and have the other amp. I was just going to say, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so I know we're, we're running late. We're running long. Somebody asked me about private lessons. 
Um, please go over to JM Guitar Lessons and sign up and you get on my mailing list. I don't have any room for any more private students at the moment, uh, which I am, you know, humbled to say thank you very much, everyone. So I'm trying to think about a way to do like a kind of a group lesson thing, like with people through the channel or something that I don't know, some way that we can take care of this because I've been getting a lot of uh, requests for it and I don't have the time to do that in the courses in the channel and hang out with Keith. You know, well, I've <laughs> right. That's all important. But I've yeah. hung out and done some of your master classes. I think that's a great way yes. in the doorway to get a sense of sort of Jeff's teaching style. Um, and I, I don't think a week goes by that I don't go dig into one of you know the. I've said this before. I I took lessons with Jeff through True Fire All Access mm -hmm. for I mean maybe a decade before I ever connected with him and you know started doing projects together and stuff. So there's so many different ways you can get get a little piece of Jeff's teaching and these master classes you've been doing are amazing. Thanks. Yeah. So you can go over the channel, Jim guitar lessons. I do have an inner circle membership where you get everything on, for under one umbrella price. And we do a live weekly uh, to our monthly stream where I answer questions and all that. Um, and that's limited, limited seating for that. We're going to keep that kind of small. So you can check that out or you just go over and check out the jam guitar lessons website. Also, um, I do have all my stuff at true fire, uh, moving forward. All this stuff is going to be on jam guitar lessons. Uh, there's, no negative stuff. People are like, oh, what's wrong with you and True Fire? Not a freaking thing. I love True Fire. I am where I am today. Uh, whatever. That sounds kind of arrogant. You know what I'm saying? As a result of all the work I did with them. Great people. Absolutely love them. Um, but, I, you know, I just want to do my own thing. I can, put, then I, have, I can put out anything I want, when I want to put out. It's all, my, it's all on me, all my schedule, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But if you decide to go up for True Fire All Access, do it through Keith's site because he gets a – he gets a little affiliate link and that really helps yeah, him nice out a little, lot. I got a nice little thank you over there. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do sign up for True Fire All Access, which I think is great, not as great, of course, as JM Guitar Lessons, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but you there, know, are few, I really, there are a few good teachers there. I'm very proud of the work <laughs> I've done you? over True Fire. <laughs> yeah. I'm very proud of it. And I think, uh, like I said, they are the, they are great people. Yeah. And uh, I, I have uh, Tim Lurch. I'm hoping to get my next video out on Friday this week. I'm a little, a little behind. And then next week, I'm going to have Tim Lurch on, and we're going to talk about, I told Jeff this earlier, we're going to talk about sort of, um, uh, you know, why you take lessons anyway. Wh yeah. What is the point. motivation for feeling like you need to improve all the time? Tim and I have both done that. We've had really interesting conversations about it. I'm like, we need to take this on on the air and, and, and kick this around. And I said to Jeff earlier today, another interesting stream might be, why did you start playing in the first place? So. Right. Yeah, which is a, which a, is a great thing to go back a, to what what was the original motivation for picking up a guitar? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. it's a, it's a great thing. I try to think about that all the time. You know what I mean? Like, um, so it's reading some questions, but I I feel really like um, uh, just staying in touch with trying to get better, or learning from. There's always something you can get from somebody else. Fortunately, I've got some really good friends who are players. We get together on occasion. You know, and you're like, oh, great. I got something I can work on. But uh, try to remember why you started to play is a great question to, yeah. to well, bring back. I've, I've been, the do, I've been doing intro. this acoustic thing that's taken me back to music that I played when I was in my teens. But a lot of those guys are just way better at soloing over, you know, uh, yeah. bluegrass chords than I am. And I'm like, boy, I, I never really got better at that because I didn't. Nobody's asking you to solo, you know, uh, when mm -hmm. I was doing that stuff when I was 15 years old. And so, you know, it, I think the best reason to take lessons and pick up your at-home practice amp is because the people you're already playing music with are inspiring you to, to, you know, get, pick up your level. Or you could do what Jeff did and go on the road with, uh, Robin Ford to him, kick your ass about, uh, I'm sorry, who? your comping. Yeah. Sorry, who? <laughs> yes. Get to work over there. You get my ass kicked every <laughs> night. And when... That sounds like, I, I said once, I think on a live stream that you had both the, the, the gig that we're all we all dream of and is a nightmare for all of us that we're on stage with Robin Ford. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it glad was it was both. Here. Yeah, it was both. I mean, I never lost sight of um, how fortunate I am and how generous he was to bring me on there. And uh, there are also some nights, you know, you really had to have your ego in in check. Like I have to remind myself that, yeah, that's that's yeah, yeah, him. And I got to keep in mind that I'm just, you know, fortunate enough to be there, you know. Yeah. Black, um, Black Hat Music says, my wife won't let me pursue my original motivation to start playing the guitar. And I was going to say, my joke, my standing joke about that is, if you started playing the guitar between the ages of 12 and 15, and you give a reason other than I was trying to impress girls, you're lying. I'm sorry. Hey, well, everybody's here. Brett Papa. Where did Robin Ooh. go on the road with Jeff? Hey, Robin was on my gig the other week. 
That was not him. <laughs> but was he generous there? He was super generous. Yeah. He, he yeah, deferred he, to me. He was yeah. totally great. He's a consummate professional. No, he's, a, he's, he's a great He's guy. been doing this a little while. Yeah. He's the best. He's the best. He knows how to know. do it. Yeah. And he can kind of play. Yeah. There you go. Not bad. Um, what's up, Brett Papa? Everybody go over to Brett Papa. If you, or you all know Brett Papa, but definitely go over to Brett. We had a lot of hanging over at Nam. We could do a thing. Got to have Brett on one day. That'd be fun. You, you got to come on, Brett. We'll do that. He, la he laughs like I do. He does. Just crack him up. And, uh, we can talk about Nam, which was very different this year. Hmm. Another conversation. There you go. Um, all right. Well, we're keeping BV up super late. Here we go. Dude, I saw the gig with Rob and your playing was on par, no doubt. Thank you very much. You know, I'll, I'll admit, I'll, I'll admit this on the air that um, it, I, I've always wanted a do-over with Robin because, <laughs> um, how do I put it this well? Well, first of all, you know, uh, he's Robin, you know, like he's just one of my heroes. So there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, he's my hero, you know? Um, so you're on stage with a, a living legend who played with Miles Davis and all this stuff, a guy who influenced me dramatically, like, tremendously. And then, you know, we became friends and he's like, Hey, let's do a record together. I'm like, ah, you know, and then let's go on the road. So I became a lot better guitar player because I played with him. I mean, and the Bay people that play, uh, Jimmy Haslip and Toss Panos, me and Robin. I mean, I don't get better playing with those guys. I'm not paying attention. You know, right. I'm not doing, you know. So, um, well, if you're not getting better, you're probably going to get left in the next town. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With a bus ticket. Yeah. So I was very, very self conscious, though, you know, and then, um, you know, you're on stage and then you know, the dynamics of the road and all this stuff. And he was always really cool. I'm not saying it, I'm putting anything on him. But I never felt I really kind of cut loose because it was his gig. And then I was, you know, it's kind of self-conscious and it's all in my own head. Uh, so when we did this gig, I was like, you know, we sound, I was worried because I'm like, am I going to get out of my head? And I, we did the sound check and I was like, all right, I'm cool. This is cool. So I felt good that I played as well as I could uh, under the circumstances of not having gigged in a few months and then being on stage with Robin again. So who's, you know, so I felt pretty I good about it. There are recordings. I have recordings. I just haven't gotten them yet from the club. I got to go through them. Um, so you'll see some stuff. I'm going to pick and choose the stuff. You know, I think I think when you the next day or a couple of days after when we talked about it, you were like, um, OK, I'm on stage with Robin. What better time to just go for it? My gig. Let's go. Yeah. And I thought that was the, that's the absolute perfect embodiment of the attitude that really anybody should have if they're standing on stage. It's like, you know, I'm just going to go. I, I got to go for it. So. Yeah, you know, and it was just, and he's cool, you know, I mean, he's great. He was smiling. And it was funny. We did one of um, his tunes called 1968 from the record, and it's got all these crazy chord changes. Um, and he's like, oh, let's do that tune. I'm like, all right, let's let's do it. And he, we start soloing over at rehearsal, the sound check, which was rehearsal. He goes, I wrote these, right? And I'm like, yes, you did. You know, and he's like, because they're really tricky. And he's like, there's nothing intuitive about these chord changes. I'm like, no. He's like, you called it. You and I said, you called, yeah. And I, I said to the bass player, I'm like, man, these changes, I hate these changes that kill me. And, and Andy Hess is like, well, you wrote them. I'm like, no, he wrote them. <laughs> you know, so what was funny if you went to the gig, like if, between the both of us, which made me feel pretty good, it was a clam fest on that course. Like at some point he looked over at me, kind of smiled and laughed. And I took a solo and afterwards. He was like, like yeah. I think we all right. Live, you know? I think we should do a live stream where we just play that tune and, and talk about it. Right. So I have it somewhere. <laughs> I will have that. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, uh, um, Maybe I'll show that one. It was pretty funny. There's a few, <laughs> there's a few notes that I, I remember in my head going, yeah, maybe that one won't get, make it to YouTube. Cause that's yeah. usually what happens. Like the one or two videos that made it to YouTube of me playing with Robin. One guy was in the gear page. I'm like, here's Jeff playing with Robin. He goes, yeah, it sounds like Jeff's kind of pushing the, the extremes of his technique on this. I'm like, dude, it was the first gig of the tour. You know what I mean? It was just, you know, like all those things. So somebody picks the one clip. You're like, no, not that clip. And they just happen to post that, you know, yeah. pretty funny stuff. Jason Carter chimes in with what I say in my head all the time. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, right. And you know, it's a it's a fun room. And if you have the attitude of like, this is fun, I'm just gonna go for it. That's what that's one thing I absolutely loved um about playing with Robin is the feeling of it's always about the music and just, just go for it and let's see what happens. You know, like you can play, so let's just let's just light it up and let's see what happens, you know. And that's a really uh, nice lesson you know, to yeah. have reaffirmed. 
somebody told me when I used to do a lot of public speaking in my old gig working in a university, they said, the crowd isn't there waiting for you to screw up. Yeah. But most people in the room are rooting for you. Yeah, that's so true. Another th really good thing to remember. So go for it, you know? Yeah. And there was lots of love in that room for sure. Yeah, it was sure. fun. There you go. And every guitar player in New York area. <laughs> right. I was going to say a room full of guitar players. Right. Yeah, you'll go from like, oh, there's Oz Noy. Hey, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Who's a great guy. I'm friends with Oz. I'm set to make yeah. a joke. All right. So, hey, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, Keith, for being here. Um, I got to go make dinner, too. I got to walk the dogs. Uh, I appreciate everyone being here. I'm going to be next week. I'm starting to do this every week again. Keith's going to be on every week because it makes it so much more fun. <laughs> well, I, I told him I'm the color man. I'm Ed McMahon. Yeah, he's there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I think we're friends because I laugh at his jokes because I think he's funny. <laughs> Otherwise, hey, uh, you'll be out of here. Hey, 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 now. Hey, now. Hey, now. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, hey, thanks so much to uh, everybody who joined us today. And thanks to BB as always with the question, answering all the questions and, and talking about my master class this weekend. Check that out. Jam guitar lessons. Also, if you do are interested in private lessons, just shoot, sign up to go to YouTube freebies, put your email there, any, and it, and let anything that goes out. I'm trying to figure out a way to get more people to do that. Uh, you could be on the mailing list at that point at Joe Jam Guitar Lessons for anything new. And uh, yeah, cool. So thanks so much. Thanks, Keith. Uh, yes, you're sir. the man. And um, we'll see all you guys 